this morning. If you've looked in the bulletin, you know that I've titled today's sermon, The Last Earthly Years of the Apostle Paul. Now, as you're opening up your bulletin, maybe you found this paper falling out. So I want to, it's going to sort of be a Bible study this morning. So this paper is sermon notes. And as you see at the very bottom of the page, it says, in a sermon that is well designed, these questions can all be answered satisfactorily. And that's the goal as you spend time here this morning, is that each of these questions, what is this sermon about? Well, I've already told you. It's about the last days of the Apostle Paul, or the last years, for that matter, of the Apostle Paul. What is the preacher saying about it? Well, I'm going to tell you this morning that you have a lot to learn from the last years of the Apostle Paul. His mannerisms, the things he talked about, the things he believed, the things he preached, we're going to gain a lot out of this this morning. Is it true? Oh, yes, it is. Do you believe it? That's a question for you to examine yourself and think about this morning. What difference does it make? Again, that's something I believe you need to work out in your own life as we endeavor to act out acts in our own lives. Now also, if you flip over your bulletin, you'll notice on the back, I've provided a map. It's a little dark. There's probably a better one. If you were to go to Google and just put in Paul's third missionary journey, you'll find a colorful one, a better one, but there's a map nonetheless. As I go through some thoughts this morning, you might want to look at that map. So we are continuing our summer sermon series, a look at Luke and Acts. We're thinking through the scriptures. We've been doing that for about four years. There, I say we've been doing that since the beginning of this church, is thinking through what the scriptures teach. We seek, search, study, and prove the scriptures. We shake and squeeze them like you do an old ketchup bottle. Everyone here, I think, knows that analogy. I don't like to waste things. When my ketchup gets low, I add a little water to it, shake the bottle, and make sure I get everything out of the bottle that you're supposed to. That's how I like to read my Bible. Get everything I'm supposed to get out of it that I'm supposed to. And interestingly enough, a little bit of water. Water is a picture of the Spirit of God in Scripture. So dare I say, add a little bit of water to your seeking, searching, studying, and improving the Bible. We're learning from Luke. We have a lot to learn. Luke wrote these two letters, these two documents, Luke and Acts. And he wrote them with the intention to send them to a man named Theophilus. A matter of fact, I call this the five W's and the one H. Who, what, where, why, when, and how. Five W's, one H of Luke and Acts. Luke is a disciple of Jesus Christ. He's a companion of the Apostle Paul. He's writing this investigative document, Luke and Acts, to provide court documents to Nero's court, Caesar's court, if you will. He writes specifically to a man named Theophilus. I suppose and I believe that that man was most likely a court officer for Nero's court. And as I go through today's sermon, you'll know and understand why documents being submitted in this fashion to Nero's court were important. This writing was written about 58 to 61 AD, and the topic is Jesus Christ's ministry. It began in Luke, his apostles' ministry, which continues into the book of Acts, and ultimately the apostle Paul, which becomes the focal point of the book of Acts. Luke writing to Theophilus, telling him about Jesus, the apostles, and the apostle Paul. Today we're going to look specifically at Acts chapters 20 through 26. In our reading of Acts chapters 20 through 20, I'm sorry, 20 through 26, yes, we find ourselves in the years 52 to 57, learning of the Apostle Paul's third missionary journey, which again is that map that you see on the back of your bulletin. We're also going to learn about his arrest in Jerusalem and his appeal to Caesar. Thus you see why having documents to follow him to Caesar are going to be important. In my accounting, these details to you this morning, I'd like you to keep in mind that what we are essentially learning here is that the last, earth, the last earthly years of the Apostle Paul can be helpful to us. As the Apostle Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, follow me as I follow Christ. So we're going to endeavor to do that this morning. So there's three parts to the sermon. All the while spending most of our time in the latter part, considering the important doctrinal and applicational things the Apostle Paul mentions in his lectures. So I trust the Lord will bless each of us with discernment this morning regarding the things we believe and the way we live. So the first thing I want to talk to us about is the mannerisms of the Apostle Paul. If you'd like to open up with me to Acts chapter 20. If you're reading from a pew Bible, that's going to be found on page 1113. I 
I know we have food to eat, so I'm not going to be too long this morning. What I want us to notice in the mannerisms of the Apostle Paul, something I alluded to last week, was the amount of time that the Apostle Paul stayed in certain places, how much time he spent with people. Because contrary to the street evangelists, the Apostle Paul believed that the best way for folks to understand good doctrine is not to scream at them through a megaphone as they're passing by you on the street, uh, not to just offer up a quick Bible verse, but rather to spend time with people and help them better understand the things he was saying. Let me go ahead and prove that to you. If you look at Acts chapter 20, verse 3, it says, And there, speaking about Greece, he spent three months, and then there was a plot formed against him by the Jews. He decided to set sail for Syria. So he stayed there until a plot was set for him to, to come after him. For three months he spent time there in Greece. Look at verse 6. We sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came to Troas within five days. And there we stayed seven days. So now he spent seven days. Again, not a street preacher yelling at folks. He's spending time, taking the time to help people understand the truth. Look at verse 11. When he had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he talked with them a long while until daybreak and then left. He spends all night talking about these things. And I obviously, I think most of you know there's going to be a part here in the verse I alluded to last week where he talks all the way till midnight. Speaking till midnight about these things. There's some churches that will hold you till midnight uh, talking about the things of God. Hey, praise God. Uh, we're not that church, though. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> Acts chapter 20, verse, uh, let's see, 7. There it is. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to him, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. Don't worry, folks. Verse 11, uh, when he had gone back up, I mentioned that when he stayed till daybreak. Verse 16 for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, because he already had. For he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, on the, on the day of Pentecost. So he has a mission, but he's willing to spend the time, do everything that's necessary to take time for people. Might we be a people that are like that? Take time for people? Take time to help people understand the truth? Not just kind of feel like we have to drop it in people's laps and run? No. And then lastly, verse... 31. Therefore, be on alert, remembering that night and day, for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. That's church, uh, Paul at Ephesus. He spent three years in Ephesus. Day and night, he says, getting, helping them, and with tears at that. A lot of energy put into this. A lot of compassion to help folks understand the truth of God. That's the first thing I want to mark out the type of people we should be. We're going to take time and spend time with Help them understand the truth. And I know that's easier said than done because we live in a hustle and bustle society. It's all about go, go, go. But might I remind you, might I remind myself that the type of people we're supposed to be are people that fellowship and spend time with each other. And it's not always wrangling about Bible verses. As you go through the New Testament letters, you notice sometimes it's just practical things that we're supposed to spend time with each other on. What I also want you to see about Paul's life, let's continue. Uh, look at verse 18 with me. And I'm going to read here uh, through this chapter, kind of into chapter 21. Verse 18, and when they had come to him, he said, this is the elders of Ephesus. What I want you to discern is how Paul lives his life, the type of person that he is, which is going to be very evident as I read this. Verse 18, and when they had come to him, he said to them, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink back from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, right there you see some interesting things that we should be marking out for our own lives. Paul says that he served with humility. We ought to be those things. That serve with humility, dealing with tears and trials, not allowing our tears and, tears and trials to move us in a negative path, but rather allowing them to cause us to rejoice. As we've noticed in the book of Acts, every time the church experienced trial, they rejoice because they know the Lord has said, you're blessed to suffer through these things so that you might be equipped and built up. You see that in the book of James. I'm not going to go there. However, in James, it talks about that if you persevere through your trials, you're ultimately being built up. 
Continuing here in verse 24. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify solemnly to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that all of you, among whom I went about preaching the kingdom, will no longer see my face. So again, notice, the Apostle Paul was steadfast in his proclamation of the gospel. The gospel of what? The preaching of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Not about dying and going to heaven, not about the rapture, not about all these things preachers are talking about. The preaching of the kingdom of God. And we've already seen, as we've been going through the New Testament chronologically, in Romans 14, it tells us what the kingdom of God is. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the basis of the kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Continuing here in our text, verse 27. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. One of the things, a lot of preachers spend time doing subject or topical sermons, and I do that here and there. However, it's very important to just go chronologically through the scriptures, as we've been doing. Sometimes it's boring. I get it. Uh, but again, it makes sure that we're hearing the whole counsel of God, that certain things aren't being missed. So that's why I've, I've enjoyed the last, let's say, five or six years, where we've just decided, let's learn the Bible. Let's go through. We started in the Old, now we're in the New. And we're going chronologically through the New Testament. So... It's important to hear the whole counsel of God. Verse 28. Or excuse me, jump with me over to verse 31. Therefore be on alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. You see the point there. Verse 33. I have coveted no one's silver, gold, or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands minister to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus, that he himself said, it is blessed, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Do you see the mannerisms, the attitude of the Apostle Paul? He decided, he knew that he had to work to eat. He knew that he should when he works and he eats, it's not just about himself, but rather it's about helping those that are around him that are in need. He knows that it's important to remember the things Jesus said. Hello. That's what we do here. We remind ourselves of the things Jesus said. And then lastly, Paul was a person given to prayer. Might we be people that are given to prayer? One other thing I want to highlight here would be in verse 13 of chapter 21 says then Paul answered what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart for I am ready not only to be bound but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus so again you see the type of person Paul was don't listen to people who want to stop you from following Jesus here they're telling him don't go to Jerusalem you're going to die there but God has already told him to go there and be willing to sacrifice his life I know uh, Pastor Dave Curtis of Marine Bible Church, he has a, uh, a, a sermon on this passage where he taught uh, bad advice from good friends. I think we all know a little bit about that. Right? Bad advice from good friends. You remember when Simon Peter goes to Jesus and he says, they will never kill you. The whole purpose of Jesus was to come to die for his people. Meanwhile, you have his disciple coming up to him saying, Lord, they'll never kill you. I'll fight for you. And what does Jesus say? You get behind me, Satan. You have not in mind the things of God, but the things of man. Might we be like the Apostle Paul and have the things of God in mind, not the things of man? Might we be like the Apostle Paul and not listen to bad advice from good friends? We have people who listen to good advice, hopefully, from good friends. Amen? Good advice from Jesus. And what we see here is that Paul's going to Jerusalem. He's going to go to Jerusalem, and then his goal, later on, we're going to notice, is to go to Rome. And what I want to share with you about that is to be a people that are on mission. Ask God to guide you. What is he guiding you into? I doubt he's sending you to Jerusalem or to Rome. Maybe, maybe. But uh, some, I don't imagine the majority of us are going to Jerusalem or Rome. Uh, but rather, ask God to convince you. How does he want you to be missional like the Apostle Paul was missional? How does he want you to be about the Father's business? How does he want you to be spiritually minded or kingdom focused like the Apostle Paul was? Now that brings me on to my second part here. The Apostle Paul's arrest. And I just have two simple points to make. I'll, I'll type up all my notes here and put them on our website. That way if you want to go verse by verse and see this. Uh, what we see is that angry mobs end up causing the Apostle Paul's arrest. He goes preaching, angry mobs, they kind of 
They've been doing this all throughout the book of Acts. But what we see in the last couple of chapters, 20 through 26, is these angry mobs come together and they desire for Paul's arrest. For example, we'll just look at 10 verses. Acts 21, verse 30. Here we read. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city. Uh, sorry, verse 29, I started that here. Yeah, 29. Uh, for they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with Paul, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was provoked, and the people rushed together, and taking hold of Paul, they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. While they were seeking to kill him, a report came up to the commander of the Roman cohort that all of Jerusalem was in confusion. At once he took some soldiers with him and centurions, and they ran down to them. And when they saw that the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came upon him and took hold of him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. And he began asking who he was and what he had done. But among the crowd, some were shouting one thing and some another. And when they could not find out the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. When he got, when he got to the stairs, he was carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people kept following him, shouting, Away with him! As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the commander, May I ask you something? May I say something to you? And he said, Do you know Greek? Then you are not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a revolt and led 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness. But Paul said, I am a Jew of Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no significant city. And I beg you, allow me to speak to the people. When he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the stairs, motioned to the people with his hand, and there was a great hush, and he spoke to them in their Hebrew dialect. So again, I want you to notice here, angry mobs. This is just one example you're going to see. If you continue reading in Acts chapter 22 and in Acts chapter 23, these angry mobs cause the Apostle Paul to be arrested. And interestingly enough, if you look at his charges, uh, matter of fact, let's just take a look. Uh, verse 30 of chapter 21. They suppose that Paul had brought a Gentile trophimus of Ephesians into the temple. Notice what it says. They supposed that Paul brought this man. They had no proof. Then, if you jump, jump over to verse 27, yeah, 21, 27, sorry about that. Uh, when the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him in the temple, began to stir up the crowds, laying hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, come to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people. They're saying Paul's preaching against their people. They're saying he's preaching against the law. They're saying he's preaching against the temple. And besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. Again, all of this is supposed. Supposedly, Paul did all of this. I would offer that Paul wasn't speaking against their laws, against the people and against the temple, but rather was offering up the teachings of Jesus. Now, if you look with me over at chapter 23, verse 26. This is a letter that was written on behalf of the Apostle Paul. It says, Claudius, Claudius Lysias, to the most excellent Governor Felix, greetings. When this man was arrested by the Jews and was about to be slain by them, I came upon them with the troops and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. And wanting to ascertain the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to the council. I found him to be accused over questions about their law, but under no accusation deserving death or imprisonment. When I was informed that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him at once to you at once, also instructing his accusers to bring charges against you before him. So if you notice here, there's really no basis for the Apostle Paul's arrest. They seem to think that he's violated the law, that he's spoken against the law of Moses, he's spoken against the temple, spoken against the Jews, and now he's in the hands of the Romans because the Romans simply, they're keeping order, and they're saying, I don't think this man's done anything deserving of death or imprisonment. They don't, there's really not a good charge against the Apostle Paul. Uh, let's go ahead and jump over to a couple other texts. 24, or 25, let's look at chapter 25, verse 7. After Paul arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem around him, bringing many and serious charges against him, which they could not prove, while Paul said in his own defense, I have committed no offense either against the law of the Jews or against the temple or against Caesar. So there you have it. Paul telling you himself he'd done nothing wrong. But yet here he is, locked up. Let's go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 25, and I just want to read verses 24 to 27 to you. 
Festus said, King Agrippa, and all you gentlemen here present with us, you see this man about whom all the people of the Jews appealed to me, both at Jerusalem and here, loudly declaring that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he committed nothing worthy of death. And since he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him. Yet, I have nothing definite about him to write, my lord. Therefore, I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after investigation has been taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems absurd to me in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. So hopefully I've proven my point here. The charges against <coughs> Paul were, were fake. There was no true charge against the Apostle Paul to have him arrested by the Jews and thus have him arrested by the Romans. But how does Paul act? This is injustice. But Paul keeps his disposition. He's in a quarrel with a, or a controversy with a foolish man, if you will. Going back to our proverb, he keeps his disposition. What I want us to notice is the addresses that the Apostle Paul gives. And that's where I want to kind of conclude this morning. So angry mobs stir up the crowds. There's no real basis to what they're saying. And unfortunately, it's led to the Apostle Paul's arrest. So now, I want us to listen and mark out the right things to believe. But that's called this orthodoxy, right belief, doctrines, good doctrine, as well as the right ways to act, application, or another term for that is orthopraxis, right practices. I want us to listen to the messages, the sermons of the Apostle Paul. Forget Mike Miana for a moment. Let's hear what the Apostle Paul has to say and allow that to give us right belief and right doctrine. Sound about right? Okay. So our first message we're going to hear is going to be Acts chapter 20. And I'm going to start at verse 17. Acts 20. Acts 20. Actually, I've already sort of accounted that to you. So we're going to move past that one. If you remember, that was the Paul talking to the Ephesian elders. And he was humble. He expressed that he spent a lot of time with them, that he uh, spent time with them in tears, seeking for them to understand the right doctrines. He declared the whole doctrine of God to them. So I think, yeah, right belief and doctrine has already been outlined there. So let's turn two chapters forward to Acts chapter 22. And here we have Paul, after his arrest, remember, he asked the the leader there, uh, can I go ahead and speak to the people? Right? If you look at verse 40, the previous chapter, when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the stairs, motioned to the people with his hand, and now he speaks in Hebrew. And this is what he says. Chapter 22, verse 1. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. And when they had heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of a Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you are all today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prison, also as the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify. For from them I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. But it happened that as I was on my way approaching Damascus, about noontime, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus, the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me saw the light, to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, Lord, what shall I do? And the Lord said to me, Get up and go into Damascus, and there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you. But since I could not see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. A certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the standard of the law, and as, who was well spoken of by the Jews and all who lived there, came to me and standing near said to me, Brother Saul, receive sight. And at that very time I looked up at him, and he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see right the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. It happened that when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, that I fell into a trance, and I saw him saying to me, 
Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of your witness Stephen was being shed, I was also standing by approving and watching out for the coats of those who were slain. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. They listened to him and this statement, and they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. I don't think he said anything that should have caused them to say that. But again, you see the Apostle Paul telling them, explaining his testimony, explaining to them the things that happened to him and why he has become passionate about the things of God, because God appointed him to do it. Notice that. He, let me give you a little bit of doctrine here. If you've seen our sign in the front, it says, this is a sovereign grace, fulfilled Bible prophecy church. Edward already helped you understand why we believe in fulfilled Bible prophecy. However, sovereign grace means that we don't believe that it's anything special about anyone in this room that we've come to understand Jesus. But it was God's work entirely. God's the one that took me out of darkness and brought me into his marvelous light. He's the one who appointed me to believe. As it says here in verse 14, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will. That can be said of each of us as well. It's not, you're not smarter, brighter, better than anybody else on this planet. God worked within you and made you understand his will. Now let's go ahead and jump over to Acts chapter 23. We're going to look here uh, in Acts chapter 23. Now Paul is preaching before the council, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Sanhedrin. Verse 1. Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. The high priest Ananias commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wool. Do you sit and try me according to the law, and in violation of the law, order me to be struck? But the bystander said, Do you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I was not aware, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, You shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. But perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the others were Pharisees, Paul began to cry out in the council, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. As he said this, there was a dissension between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. And there occurred a great uproar, and some of the scribes of the Pharisaic party stood up and began to argue, heatedly saying, We find nothing wrong with this man. Suppose a spirit or an angel has spoken to him. And a great dissension developed. The commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them and ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him to the barracks. So again, notice why the apostle Paul said he's on trial. For the hope and of the resurrection. Notice also Paul used wisdom in the way he was preaching this message. And he knew, well, if I say this, it will cause a divide, and these men will be divided in among themselves, and they won't be able to make a charge against me, which as we see, was the case. What we find in Acts chapter 25, verses 11 through 12, is that in the midst of this, this is where the Apostle Paul says, I appeal to Caesar. He knows that he's not going to be treated right by the Jewish council uh, or by these local officials. So I appeal to Caesar. I need the emperor to hear my case. Wisdom on the Apostle Paul's part. And then lastly, the last message we'll consider this morning is going to be found in Acts chapter 26. We're going to start at verse 1. I'm going to do a little bouncing around, but we're going to go through the fullness of what Paul says here. Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. Some might say he must have been an Italian from New York. Speaking of <laughs> Verse 2. In regard to all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. One thing I want to mark out about that. See, we talk a lot around here about cultural background and understanding the context. If you notice right there, that verse makes my point. It's easier to talk about the things of God and the scriptures with folks that are more accustomed to the traditions and the ideas of the Jews. If people don't know the traditions and ideas of the Jews, 
they can understand the truth so that many times because that's God doing a work within them. But again, it makes it easier to talk about these things with people that have done some homework and understand the tradition. Again, that's why the Apostle Paul says, it's easier to talk to you. I, I, you know, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Verse 4. So then all Jews may know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem. Since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. And now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O oh King, I am being accused by the Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God raises the dead? So then I, I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. So while engaged, I was journeying toward Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me with those who were journeying with me. And when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said to me, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you as a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sent you, to open the eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So King Agrippa did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those at Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout the entire region of Judea, and even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So, having obtained help from God, I stand this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of the resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light to both the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Now notice, while Paul was saying this, in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind, in case you feel alone when you declare the things of God. You are out of your mind. Your great learning has driven, driven you mad. Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time, you believe you'll persuade me to become a Christian? And Paul said, I would wish to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these changes. So I want you to notice this morning, we saw repeatedly in these messages that the Apostle Paul preached nothing other than what the prophets and Moses said was going to occur. That's where our doctrine must begin, in the Old Testament. We are not at liberty to make up what we think the New Testament is speaking about, but rather we have to seek, search, study, and prove the Old Testament to understand the hope that the apostles had, that Jesus proclaimed, etc. Paul talks about the kingdom of God. Paul shares his testimony. Might I encourage each of us to tell our testimony all the more? This week, find opportunity. Matter of fact, I'll share with each of you, I was on a program this past week in Australia where I had the privilege to talk about my testimony. I'll share that in our weekly update this week. I encourage all of you to be sharing your testimony, whether it's on podcasts or in person. Stand fast in your testimony as the Apostle Paul did. Also, one last thing I'll mention would be if you're reading the messages of Paul, hopefully this morning I've made my point. 
we can learn good doctrine from reading through Acts chapters 20 through 26. Listening to the Apostle Paul's messages and saying, is that what I believe? Or do I believe something else? Have I been listening to sermons that are talking about something else? It's not the Apostle's doctrine. Though. That's what we should be learning, the Apostle's doctrine. I want you to notice that the Apostle Paul said that I am blameless. My conscience is clear before God. Yet he admits that he went about killing Christians. He calls his identity under the law dumb. He lived in that identity, as he mentions here, strictly. So having a clear conscience before God doesn't mean that we're perfect. It simply means that we've accepted the forgiveness of God. Because again, we see here, Paul had plenty of problems, but yet he declares that he had a clear conscience with God. Might we receive that message of forgiveness? This morning, the grace of God. Apostle Paul said he did not stop from declaring the grace of God to the people of God. It's not about condemnation. It's not about judgment. It's not about dying and going to heaven. It's not about getting some sort of new body when you die. That's not the gospel. We discern here what the gospel is through Acts chapters 20 through 26. And I pray, I trust, that I've given some justice to that message this morning. I hope you will continue to act out that. Might we appreciate, and by the way, let me just share this one thing. I've said it a couple weeks ago, I want to make sure I say it again this morning. Acting out Acts does not mean going to the book of Acts and saying, well, the Apostle Paul felt called to go to Jerusalem, therefore I have to go to Jerusalem. It's not reading the verse and saying that verse has to directly apply to you. It's reading the verse maturely and saying, okay, well, that's what the Apostle Paul was called to, but I'm called to do something as well. That's mature reading. Mature reading of the Bible is not saying I have to, everything they're waiting for, I have to wait for. Everything they're doing, I have to do. No, it's saying, well, what they were waiting for maybe puts me in a position to not be waiting for them. Maybe you are waiting for certain things that they're waiting for, but I would argue the coming of Jesus, the resurrection of the dead is not that. What you're, that what you're waiting for. Just like you're not waiting to get transferred to Rome or go on a mission to Jerusalem. We have to read maturely and find application in that manner. Might we appreciate the desire to follow after the Apostle Paul's mannerisms, follow him as he followed Christ. Might we also be a people prone to seeking, searching, studying, and proving apostolic doctrine. How that applies to what you believe and how that applies to the way you live. Might we be kingdom citizens that demonstrate Jesus Christ and his kingdom, kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy in our lives. As we know and call it around here at Blue Point, a thinking faith. I imagine our reading today will leave us with natural wonder. Well, what happens? Does Paul go home? Does Paul, get a, does Paul die? What, what happens? Does he get sentenced to 10 years in prison? What, what's the story? Keep that one here. Because I want to see you next week. Next week, we're going to move to the conclusion of this book. We're going to move to the conclusion of our summer sermon series. And as we advance further into the fall season, we're going to talk about exactly that, advancing the faith. Obviously, as we move closer to our Bible conference in November. God bless. Go in peace. See you all in the fellowship room for our fifth Sunday pop-up. Amen.